what goes into making the ambience of the panic room. So for example, on these channels, we have this sound. This is one of the layers of the backgrounds that went into to the sound of the panic room itself. And what Fincher wanted to do was have it sort of sound isolated, um, yet there's air conditioning, sort of like on one level there's like a technical side of things, uh, you know, like air conditioning, electronics, television monitors, that sort of thing. But on the other hand, there's sort of a kind of the foreboding quality of it. So this layer is, is sort of trying to, you know, feed more to that texture. This one is actually made out of a, of a choir uh, that was sampled into a keyboard and slowed down and kind of layered and filtered. So if you can listen carefully, you can hear voices. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I've kind of disguised them. Then you can add to it these types of sounds. Uh, this is made out of rain. This sound right here was a, a rain sample that was filtered. We had to do so much rain for the film that I took uh, some rain and I sampled it and then ran it through a bunch of delays and sort of tried to do a little Brian Eno type treatment where you take one noise and you take it all the way to the extreme and change it. So that's what this is. And again, it's raining constantly, so maybe that's what it would sound like through the pipes and whatnot. Uh, so you can blend these things together. Then down here, there's a very low sound, and that sort of is the sound of the technology and sort of the girth of the, of the panic room. And uh, this sound, we actually, Laura Hirschberg, our, our mixer, we routed this sound only through the, the subwoofer. Over here, fan spinning, and, um, and here's another sound that um, the electronics of the televisions, the winds of the hard drives. One of the things that David wanted to have in the film is that he wanted the space, even though the space was going to be very small, he wanted the feeling that when we went from one area of the panic room to the next, that you get a little bit closer to the televisions or further away from them or closer to the intercom or that kind of thing. So, and, and all the time, and these very subtle sounds are surrounding the character. Then there's the fluorescent light layer whenever we got close to the fluorescence. And so then of course after the fire sequence, that became a different sound when they're flickering. Here's the sound of the, of the fluorescent lights. Um, and this is really fluorescent lights that were mic'd very closely and then denoised. Um, that's the steady component. And then this sound would have been, would have been layered uh, sort of underneath. Even within the simplest scene, there's a lot of thinking that goes on and involved in just creating the ambience. When Fincher and his crew went to New York to shoot the front of the film, we went down and we just recorded like crazy. And we recorded all of our sounds in LCR, left, center, right, including the footsteps and all the props. So here is an example of an LCR recording, left, center, right, and you can hear the acoustics of the space very nicely. The production sound was okay, but one of the things that had occurred during this particular sound cue was that um, both Jim and Angus, when they were editing this scene, they wanted to elongate the cadence, the bounce of the ball, and it made it actually very difficult to cut because um, if you drop a ball, it, it bounces and it's over, but they kept it going to, to kind of increase the suspense. This one element here is just the single kick. Then we cut to here for the balls bouncing, and that was spliced. Like the ball was just banging off this ledge here. And then um, this channel right here represents a recording taken from about 30 feet away. So when you play everything together, you get this.
There was actually no water in this tub, so we had to create the feeling of it. And we went into a bathtub and recorded our own sounds. Water drips, for example. Every little sound and nuance that you would expect to have been really actually there at the time isn't there and is in fact added by other people. Here's an example of that. Jodie Foster's washing her face. There really, there really was no water there and there was no sound. So we had to create that sound. That's just one of the jobs that the sound editor has. It's a lonely job <laughs> and because no one notices the work. But ultimately, it's very satisfying because if, in fact, no one notices the work, that means you actually did it correctly. We have the sound of the room, or the ambience. And what we're trying to do is create a, a feeling of coziness and tranquility, and at the same time, sadness and loneliness and emptiness. And of course, ultimately, it was supported beautifully with Howard Shore's music that plays through here. There's a scene in Panic Room in Real 4 where Jodie Foster's character actually has to come out of the Panic Room. And David Fincher decided to shoot everything in slow motion. And um, one of the things that we decided early on was because it's, the scene is in slow motion, it would be best to not have any sound at all, to have it more musical. However, this particular scene, we thought, what if we did something that was sort of outside the realm of the, the timbres of the orchestra and the strings and the cellos and the percussion and so forth? What if we introduced a completely different color, a different sonority to the scene because it is so abstract? And then what if we had that crossfade into Howard's music? So this was actually one that Howard and I did collaborate on quite a bit. Kind of, I actually just threw all this stuff in really quickly because we were roughing it in and temping. And um, David liked it and, and I thought, well, you know, Howard's gonna probably just do something very interesting here. But when Howard heard it, he goes, Ren, you know, this is nice, maybe we should just keep this. And, and, and to me, it was always sort of rough. And what I'm gonna show you now is the rough version and then what we'll show you next is the final mix of that as it is in the film. sample of a, of a metal oil can that was performed on the keyboard similar to this one. I wanted to have a feeling of slow motion and um, this was a sound of wind which on the keyboard I could trigger at various pitches. This clip here that you see here, I actually watched it to picture and this is actually for when Jodie Foster's hand reaches up for the phone she realizes that the phone isn't there. And that's the moment when she realizes that she's in deep shit because she doesn't know where the cell phone is. So even these sounds were performed in a way that was for, to give an emotional response. And that sound specifically was for that cue. These are sort of specific sounds. Again, these are flames. It's not the sound of this panic room door opening, but the idea of something opening it is being represented in an abstract way. This sound here, was a Balinese Ketchak singer. I wanted to have some sort of emphasis for, for Jared's frustration and that movement that he has. Um, this sound is just backwards wind and it kind of is like a, it's a gasp. At this moment is when all hell breaks loose and there's a sound I created which I call the beehive sound, which is this sound. This sound, believe it or not, was made out of a commercial that David and I did a long time ago uh, that's, a, that's got a bunch of guys on rollerblades running around and they're, they're running through Tokyo. And 
and I took the entire mix and I put it through an effects chain, which gave a resonance. So anytime you hear, uh, it sort of, you see these modulations here, it's actually the sound of this completely other soundtrack going through a, a treatment. But what I liked about the sound was that it feels like bees or it feels like something bad is, uh, is approaching. And at this point um, is where in the track Howard's music enters. Originally when Howard had scored it, he had had the music go across the cut so that the music would continue and linger into the scene. And our music mixer, um, Todd Buckelheide, who's a fantastic mixer, came up with this great idea. He said, well, what if we just shut the music off? Is that the music went into the panic room and the door shut off the entire track. And it's actually quite effective because normally in film, you don't want to draw attention to the fact that the music is entering or exiting. You don't want to really be aware of music, but in this particular instance, it seemed appropriate. Go! The tools that we have, the computers and so forth, allow us to do what would normally be very difficult. So we're, we're sort of taking advantage of the technology, but I think we're indulging in it maybe a little too much. One of the things that I try and hold on to is uh, some sort of creative constraint. So for example, one of those creative constraints might be, I'm going to only give myself eight channels to edit with. And if I can't make something interesting in that eight channels, I'm gonna get rid of something and replace it with something else until I get something that is in fact interesting. And the reason why that's an important way to work is that it helps you focus on what the music and the sound is truly about. Because if you can't figure out the essence of what it's about within a creative constraint of a minimal amount of channels, then you probably are doing something wrong. Somebody, who was it, they were saying something, you know, if you had like a, all the toothpaste or shampoo in the world, you would probably use it up much more quickly than if you only had one. And you'd learn how to really conserve and make that, you know, and, and get just using the right amount of shampoo and not too much and wasting it. And it's the same thing with these types of tools. You can just lather on way right. too much. Uh, Ren Kleist, sound designer, had a lot of work on this movie. I think he worked on this movie for about six or seven months before we even started shooting. <laughs> and uh, just collecting sounds, getting, you know, sounds of the city, sounds of people in bars down the street and people walking down empty streets. You know, every time we go through a wall, there's like a special sound of inside the wall, like the hum. Or Oh, 
the mix on this movie was so complicated. There were so many tracks. And it's all because of his psychotic attention to detail and trying to make sure that everything had a really specific sound. Like that shot right there, uh, Jared throws the pen down. Well, he didn't really throw the pen down. He actually, when he holds the paper up, he drops the pen at that point. So we had to edit the sound of him dropping the pen out and then put the pen into this where he throws the uh, paper down. You'd never realize how much <laughs> sound editorial goes into a movie. This one was funny. Uh, Ren, of course, didn't end up getting a credit. So Ren used to be on the other building, and eventually Columbia said that they wouldn't give an upfront credit to a sound design, so they pushed him into the tail of it. And so we had to move Larray to that other building, so that because that was a better shot than the, uh, the, the static one that Larray was on. So the last minute changed everything around to make that work out. 